Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Heroes of the Land. Today, we sit down with Avichai Koch. In 2003, he left a high-paying, high-tech job to go live in the Negev, right near the Gaza border in Moshav Tkuma, and start his own farm. What brought him to live in such a dangerous place? During war, he has only 15 seconds to make it to a bomb shelter, which when you're working out on the field is impossible. Not only that, but the fields that he works in are called an open space, meaning the Iron Dome will not intercept a rocket that is headed to his fields, his office, the place that he works. So with no time to go to shelter and no Iron Dome to protect him, obviously the only one he could turn to for help is HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He also shares with us the incredible story how his 12-year-old son convinced him to start keeping Shemitah seven and a half years ago. But what did he do during this challenging time that he just couldn't sit around for an entire year without working out in his field? He shares all that and much more incredible, inspiring stories with us today. The Heroes of the Land series is brought to you by Karen Hashvias. We will hear more about them later in this video. And now let's get to it. I'm Israel Yudkowsky. You are listening to Foundations Podcast. Before we uh, get to Shemitah, maybe just tell us about growing up, uh, you know, when you started uh, with farming and a little bit about the place here and what you do. So I grew up in Moshav Chemed. Moshav Chemed is a Moshav close to the airport. And we moved here in 2003. Uh, I was working in computers and uh, we decided out of Zionism to do something more meaningful with our life. And we decided to move to the Negev, buy a farm and start being a farmers. So that's how we got here to Moshav Tkuma. Uh, I started to work for Kibbutz Zad. It's uh, three miles from here, two miles from here. I was working in, uh, in the fields. I was working on a carrot harvester. I used to make a third of the money that I made when I worked for computers, but I felt like I'm the happiest person on earth. Because, you know, I believe Hashem created us land workers and everything else is not so natural. And that's and, how we got here. Very nice. So uh, what do you do? I see we're sitting now in one of your greenhouses. I see there's some uh, squash uh, laying around. But what uh, what do you usually do? And also, is this something you did from the beginning? Or like, how was from when you moved? How did it develop to where you are today? So a few years after we moved here, I think three years after we lived here. So uh, I wanted to work for myself. I wanted to work in my own land. And then uh, I start building the greenhouses where we're sitting now. And I started to grow organic vegetables. And at the beginning, I used to grow only cherry tomatoes for export. I used to grow, at, I, I used to grow uh, for before, until the last Shemitah, a year before last Shemitah, not this Shemitah, the Shemitah seven years ago. I used to grow only cherry tomatoes for export. But because we had some issues with the BDS and, uh, and all those stuff, um, I decided to stop doing so and change all my farm from uh, organic cherry tomatoes to many types of organic vegetables. And uh, that's what I'm doing until today. Baruch Hashem, the change was very good. I believe everything Hashem is, make, is doing is letova. So in our area, at this time, when I used to export cherry tomatoes, we used to export 5,000 tons every year. Now wow. zero. Yeah, because of, uh, you know, the issues with the BDS. But Baruch Hashem, now we grow organic vegetables. I work with somebody who does home delivery. And uh, Baruch Hashem, no complaints. The, the tomatoes you, also used to be organic? Everything is, uh, I always uh, used to grow uh, organic vegetables, mm. always. The, the, the soil here is organic since I live here for the last uh, 19 years. Well, and how, how much uh, land do you have here? How many do now? So I have, I have two plots. This one is five acres and I have another five acres on a different place. Wow. But this is the main place where I work, where the greenhouses are. 
You live you live right uh, right right near here. Yes, my house is uh, right over there, and uh, in front of the warehouse. Mm. And I'm walking to my to my job. I don't have to drive. It's <laughs> nice. a big benefit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, what, how does it work with the uh, with the stuff that you grow? You sell it, uh, you know, to companies, stores. Like, where where do the stuff uh, uh, get in? And also the whole business, like how it works. But... I, I work with somebody who makes home delivery, and uh, he has a truck. He drives a few times a week to uh, to to the stores, and he uh, delivers the produce. He also uh, a big grower, and he also do home delivery for uh, families. Like you order online a box of uh, uh, fresh produce and you get it delivered by uh, to your door. So that that that's where all uh, all your stuff uh, goes to. Is to mostly yes, mostly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I want to start maybe talk a little bit about uh, the choice you said in 2003 that you moved here. Uh, why did you choose here? Obviously, we're really close to Gaza, the Gaza border. And I'm sure there's right above our head is a, is a piece from a, a missile that got shot down. So what is it do you feel that pulled you to, to be here? And, you know, obviously it comes with a lot of risk. Uh, so what, what pulled you to, to come to this place? So first of all, like I told you before, we wanted to do something more meaningful. Living in Moshav Chemed, close to Tel Aviv, is living in the, in the country of Tel Aviv, like we call it. We wanted to live in the country of the Negev and be so much, and be a part of the of the people who really uh, keep and, and keep the land of Israel for the next generations. We're really just a small piece of the Jewish history, you know. And we're living here. We are keeping the land of Israel. You can imagine, you know, one farmer can can keep acres of acres of land compared to somebody who lives in the city and uh, living here close to Gaza and, and walking the land of Israel, for me, is such a, I don't know how to say it in English, but it's, uh, I feel like I'm doing the best I can. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, one of the major reasons. I, I, it's not easy for my wife and the kids, and I always tell my wife, we are just a small piece of the Jewish history, and we are keeping the land of Israel. So we are, I'm very happy to be a part of it. Same as my wife, a little bit less than me, but she's also happy. Maybe tell us, like, what are the the risks and the and the stuff that need you know living in the backyard of our enemy? You know, there's the wars and there's, you know, just a couple of years ago they had the balloons with fires that started fires all around. So first, I would ask, what what are the risks you know that come with it? And then B, really, what what is the accomplishment that you feel from like being this? kind of wall of protection, because if it wouldn't be here, then Yerushalayim and Bnei Brak and Bichemesh and Tel Aviv, that's where we would have, you know, that's that would be the border with the Arabs. Uh, so kind of, you know, giving up here is, is really like protecting the rest of Israel. So I can tell you that uh, before I drafted to the army, my mother was very worried, and, but she was always used to say, every bullet has its own address. So, you know, Hashem is planning the world and things can happen no matter where you are. Here in Moshav Tkuma, we have 15 seconds from a shelter, which is not easy. 15 seconds are one five seconds from a shelter. So you can imagine, you know, when, when you hear in the radio on, or on, you look on the internet or wherever it is, that a rocket was fall on the, on the open fields. So you have to understand that the open fields are the fields where we are the farmers, where we are walking. It's the, the, our greenhouses, it's your our office. fields. <laughs> yeah, that's our office. It's here. And the Iron Dome won't intercept rockets that's supposed to fall on open fields. It's a very smart system. It knows exactly if the, if the rocket is about to fall on a, on a houses, on a place where there are houses or building apartments or, or you know, um, uh, shoes and stuff like that, but if it's supposed to fall on the on the open fields, it won't intercept the rocket. So the open fields are the places where we are now. So you could imagine that when you you walk in in the fields and all of a sudden you hear the Seva Adon, the red alert siren, and you only have 15 seconds to run to a shelter. There's no way you can get to a shelter. So the only thing you can do is say Shema Israel and lie on the ground, put your hand in between your hand and and pray for Hashem, you know? 
but it's I can tell you it's really it's really not so bad I mean and it's not easy and usually when there are wars so I'm sending my wife and the kids to be with uh, with my in-laws with my wife's parents in the uh, Yerushalayim. Baruch uh, Hashem. I don't want to complain. I don't have complaints. I mean, it's really, I, I really feel uh, that it's an accomplishment to live here and, and, and do what we are doing. I don't know how to describe it to you because I was born in Moshav. I, I, I always was very connected to the farming business. I don't know how to describe it, but the smell of the soil, when you walk your own land, when you see your own vegetables, when you plant the seedlings, you plant the seeds and you see them growing, it's, it's something, I don't know, it's, a, it's the biggest sipuk, the biggest accomplishment, this is the right yeah. word, the, for a person, that's what I think, you know. Even every regular person, when you walk, think of it, if you walk in your garden and you take care of your five plants of tomatoes and five plants of cucumbers. I, I think everybody is happy to do it. So if you do it on a big scale, then, then it's, a, it's a whole different story. Let's really start talking a little bit about Shemitah. Uh, when was the first time you started keeping Shemitah? And more importantly, what, what brought you to keeping Shemitah? So this Shemitah is, uh, Baruch Hashem, is my second one. And the first one was seven years ago. It actually started from my son, my oldest son, which is now, uh, he's almost 20 years old. Now he's in the army. He's 19 and a half. Now he's in the army. And last Shemitah, it was a few months before his bar mitzvah. And he came to me with a story, you know, those papers that they give for kids in shul. So one of them named Shalom Laam. And he came to me with a story and he shows me, ah, but look, there is a story. It was before last Shemitah, a few months before last Shemitah says, look, there is a story about a farmer who lives in the Arava region and he was not religious at all. He grows peppers and he decided to keep Shemitah. And look, he had a big bracha on his sixth year and on his eighth year. He said to me, Abba, please, this is my bar mitzvah here. I want you to keep Shemitah for my bar mitzvah. Me and my wife thought, how crazy idea could it be, you know, set all your walkers away. All your suppliers, all your customers, everything. I'm not walking. I'm shutting off the business. We thought at the beginning, we thought it's a crazy. We told him, <laughs> there's no chance. Take you on a trip. Yeah, we'll, go, we'll, we'll do, buy we'll, you we'll do something for you, but mitzvah, don't worry. Everything is going to be okay. Don't worry. But he was very, very, um, very determined. And he, he said, I'm not giving up. Abba. I want you to keep Shemitah. We thought of it, me and my wife, for, for, for a few weeks. And we said to ourselves, how can we miss a mitzvah that there are only few people in the world, free, few Jewish people in the world that could keep it and, and have the opportunity to be, uh, to be a part of it? How could we miss it? And then we decided that we're going to do it. And Baruch Hashem, I can tell you, it was really, really, really the best decision we've ever made because we had so many good things happen to us on this year and even when the Shemitah was finished we were still felt keep feeling all the time the, the, the affection of the of the Shemitah year every mm -hmm. every week every month all the time and and I couldn't wait for the next Shemitah for this one to start wow so what I would say going back you know I feel your son that he, he... First of all, to even to read the story and then come and, you know, and ask for it for you to keep Shemitah. And then even after you're saying no and to, you know, keep on pushing and not giving up. Do you know, like, where, like, where did your son get that from, the, the so, determination to, to not give up on it? So my son, at that time, he was a very uh, into being a Talmid Chacham. He was waking up in the morning on 5.30 every day and going to sleep at least 11 p.m. every day, when he was uh, only 12 years old, he used to go to the first shiur in Moshav on 5, 5.45, and until the last shiur in Moshav, in, in, the, in between he used to go to school. When he was waiting for the school bus, he was sitting with a book and learning. And when he came back from school, he was also uh, learning, and he didn't leave the, the, 
ספרים, all day, until, the, and he was going to sleep only after the last shiur in Moshav, with the rabbi of Moshav, only afterwards he was going to sleep. So he was very into it, and then he, he convinced us to do it. Wow, and wha- how did that happen, I'm sure, because, you know, you have, especially, it's not like your 25-year-old son that's working with you and is involved in the business, and he comes up with this whole plan, look, you know, it might be worth it for us to do it. So, you know, it's the 12, 12-year-old son that's asking from you to literally shut down your whole business for an entire year without knowing what's going to be, how you're going to be able to support your family. I'm sure, obviously, you need a, you know, at the end of the day, you also needed to come from you. So maybe, maybe, you know, maybe Hashem sent my son to, to start it, to, to ignite it. And then it started rolling, you know, and, and, and start building and, and we made a decision. We made it only in a few months, by the way. I couldn't see my land stands fellow. So I told my wife, it, it's going to be a big problem if I'm going to stay here and, and see my greenhouses every day and, and see all the, the weeds that you see now and all the plastic covers flying in the wind. It's not easy for me. So we decided to do uh, to this, to do something... Uh, um, to do something meaningful also on this year and we moved to we, li- we moved to Englewood, New Jersey for one year my, wa- my wife worked as a teacher and I started to work for Elal they wanted me uh, the Jewish agency won't let us go be- without me having a job so I had to find a job and somehow we decided that I'm going to work for security in Elal in the cargo and um, but it was, I didn't manage with them. A few weeks after I started, I, I, I quit. And, uh, but everything was mistader, you know. I felt like, like I have my own ashgacha during this year. And I, like I told you, even after, I felt like somebody is watching me because everything was mistader, you know, like a puzzle. And uh, that's what we did this year. I was just saying, if, if, you, if, if you didn't... You know, you left a high-tech job to, to come work in the land. So as a security guard, I'm sure, so it wasn't, uh, yeah. <laughs> it but, didn't last too long. Yeah, it, it didn't last because uh, Elal wanted me to work on Shabbat. And mm. I said, I'm not keeping Shemitah in Israel, so I'll work on Shabbat in Newark, New Jersey. So it, was, uh, it wasn't easy. And uh, I started to work for them. And I saw that the busiest day for them is Shabbat. And, you know, they don't work on Fridays. It was back then, by the way. Now everything changed. I know that uh, uh, somebody from bought them. In, uh, and now everything changed and they don't do it anymore. But seven years ago, it wasn't like that. And uh, they wanted to make me uh, work on Shabbat. And uh, I, said, I said to the guy who was in charge of the shifts over there, I said to him, please, don't, don't put me on Shabbat. I, I can't come. So for a few weeks, he was able to do it. And one day he came to me and he said, listen, I can't do it anymore. It's, um, the supervisor asked me, where are you and why are you not coming on Shabbat? Like everybody. And so I said to him, okay, do what you want. I'm not coming on Shabbat. So there is a law also in Israel and also in America that they can't make you work on your holy days. And um, so they start build me a case, you know, like, like make me uh, things that I'm not professional. Uh, so after I realized that, I went with the flow and I said, fine, okay. One day the supervisor called me to his office and he said, listen, you're not professional. You don't do your job. It's a security. You can't walk with us. I said, fine, what should I do? He said, you have to go and meet with the guy who's in charge of all the security stations of Elal all over the world. And he'll tell you what's going what's gonna to happen with you. I said, fine. Are we doing Skype conference? Are we making a phone call? He said, no. You're going to go tomorrow. It was Wednesday. He said, tomorrow, 1 p.m. In the, in the afternoon, you're going to go on the plane. You're going to land in Israel 5 a.m. in the morning. 11 a.m., you're going to meet with the guy. And then midnight, you're taking the flight back here. I said, can I stay for the weekend with my family? He said, no, 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 no. You can't come here. I said, okay, I don't want to fight with you. I'll do what you want. I landed in Israel. I, me- I came into the guy's office. He was calling me. And uh, there was another lady from the human resource there. And they sent me, 
you know why you're here? I said, of course I know, because I don't want to work on Shabbat. Then they said, no, 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 it's not because of that. You're not professional, you're not this, you're not that. What do you have to say about it? I said, listen, I came to do the best I can, but I can't work on Shabbat. And uh, if I'm not professional and I'm not good for you, then you can fire me now, it's okay. Then the guy tells me, how do you speak? You know, how, how can you talk like that? You have a family, you have a contract, you have a house in Englewood, you, your wife has, a, has to work in school. What are you going to do? How are you going to provide your family? I told him, don't worry, if I'm not professional, you can fire me right now. And I'm smiling and everything, I felt like everything is okay. I wasn't worried at all. And he's, he told me, okay, if this is the way you're talking, you're fired. In two weeks from today, Elal is going to, Elal is, um, the, the security in Elal is under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So you're going to be called for a hearing in the Israeli consulate in Manhattan. And then two weeks after, you'll be fired. And in the meantime, you can't work for us. We still have to pay you, but you can't work for us. But be prepared because in two weeks, you're, you're not going to get money anymore. So you have to find something else. I said, okay, have a great day. I left the office, I went to visit my family, I came to see the farm, my friends, everything. And at midnight, I took the plane back home. I landed in Newark, I drove to my house in Englewood, and it was uh, around 7, 8, 8 a.m. in the morning. And then I'm getting a phone call from Karen Ashvis. They called me, they say, hi, how are you? We heard that you're here in America for the year. What do you do these days? Are you available? We're looking for somebody to help us to raise money for the Israeli farmers. Are you available to work? I said, right now, I, <laughs> exactly now I'm available. I just got fired. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so everybody was happy. They took me to work with them. I, I, they took me all over the, the Jewish communities, in, mainly in the Northeast. And I met so many people and I felt the love of the people in, in America, to the farmers in Israel and to the mitzvah of Shemitah. And it was such an amazing experience for me and for my family. And also, I, I, I keep in touch with many of them. We became friends. They come to visit me. They came to visit me. Until today, they're coming to visit me. And we are very good friends. I came to visit them. And it's amazing, the connection that for me and my wife, the mitzvah of Shemitah is, is also really strengthening the connection between our brothers and sisters around the world to, to Israel, to the farmers, to, to the Negev, to, to the agriculture, to, to, to what we're doing here. People from America, and not only America, but tourists, when they come to Israel, they never come to this place. But the people who knows me, most of them coming to visit me since they meet me, and they are so happy, and I'm so happy, and... and that they are coming to visit. Yeah, it's me. crazy. I mean, like, there's not much in common between a Hasidish guy from Borough Park and a you know Israeli farmer from the Negev. So you can't even uh, imagine how many common things we do have, in especially around this mitzvah of Shemitah. I see how how important is it for them, and for us, and we see how this special mitzvah really strengthens the connection between between us because. It's important, for, it's important for all the Jewish people in, in the world to keep this mitzvah. And we are the farmers, we are the people who really can make it. It's in our hands. And we feel, we feel their love and their, and their uh, uh, care of us, the farmers, that they want us to, do and to, 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 be a, to, to be able to do this mitzvah and, 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 uh, and keep it. So I see, I see their... I see their faces, I see their, uh, when I speak with them, I see what they are doing in America, I see what Karen Ashvis is doing, and it's amazing, it's amazing. And I can see it in specific because I go there every few weeks, and then I really see it in my eyes. And I try to tell it to my friends here, to my, friend, to my, to my friends, to my farmer friends here in Israel, to try to make them understand how their brothers and sisters in America uh, care, so much care, have so much care about them here in Israel, and this is what makes the connection. It's been quite a journey over the past few months at Karen Hashvis. With Shemitah on the horizon, we span the land of Israel, reaching out to hundreds of farmers, urging them to commit themselves to leave their fields. With the promise of support, 
thousands of farmers pledged to lay down their tools and submit themselves to a higher calling. At the same time, fundraising efforts were launched across the globe for a call to partner with the heroic farmers. Claudius Rawl answered the call and came through like never before. And then, in the twilight hours of the new year, farmers on 363 settlements walked away from their fields. They did the impossible. They abandoned their land and gave up their livelihood. We reached a historic milestone. For the first time in almost 2,000 years, 51% of privately owned Jewish agricultural land is lying fallow. The achievement is unprecedented, but we're far from done. We raised enough for the farmers to commit, but it's not enough to get them through the full year. If we don't continually support the farmers, some may buckle under the burden. The sacrifice may become too large, too heavy, and they may not be able to pull through. The farmers still need our support. We gave them our word. We won't let them down. The end of the story with Elal was that uh, they still, they, they didn't even call me for, for the hearing for, I think, about four or five months. And eventually when they called me, I got to the hearing, I went into the office. There was a very nice lady, she was the officer there. I saw my supervisor from Noak Station sitting there and he was like, you know, very happy waiting for her to, you know, to fire me and throw me all uh, <laughs> down the stairs. But she called me inside into the office and she said, I heard your supervisor. What do you have to say about what happened? So I told her, listen, I came to America for shlichut. I didn't come to America for staying and living here for all of my life, like all the young kids that work for Elal. And I'm going around the communities here, the shuls, the schools, every place I can to tell them about the Negev, to tell them about the Shemitah, to tell them about the, 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 how is it living close to Gaza. And, you know, the, the lady was start, you know, she, she was like this. She was looking at me and she said, wow, it's amazing. She said, not only that I'm not going to fire you, I'm going to keep you, keep your job until the day that you want. And I even find you a, find you a different job. Don't worry, don't worry. She called her assistant, somebody named Yotam. She said, Yotam, take his phone number. I want you to be in touch with him every week. Make sure everything okay with him. We still have, we, we're gonna pay him uh, his salary. We're gonna make sure everything is uh, works out for him. We're gonna keep paying for the health insurance, everything. And I, I wanna find him a different job. <laughs> My supervisor was now changing color, you know. What's going on here? That wasn't the, the original plan. Finally, it ended up that on the day when I got back home, when the kids uh, uh, when, when everything was ready to go home. So I met my supervisor and his wife on the plane. I told him, hi, how are you? But that's it. When I, when I got home, I called my friends that still walking, used to walk back then in for Elal in Newark station. And I asked them, what happened? What did he do on the plane? They said he got fired. So you see how everything is... And, it's just one, one small story, but I had so many stories during this, this year of where I felt the Ashkacha keeping me and my wife and my kids that, like I told you before, I couldn't wait for this year to come, for this Shemitah year to come. Well, wow, that's, that's really, it's really incredible to see how, you know, everything worked out the year that you were there with, uh, you know, there's was a fire and they didn't just uh, this on the and it's like so sad to see that, you know, they still like, you know, we needed convince people about working on Shabbos and to not work on Shabbos and them needed to find. But it's really amazing how like everything worked out with Karen Ashvias and then I ended up working out even with Elal till you came back. Uh, it's really, really uh, amazing. And was there also anything in the last Shemitah or this Shemitah that involved uh, the farm itself that, you know, miracles or, or stuff that, uh, you know, similar things like, like the Elal story, but that have to do like actual with the farm so I can tell you another one story. I had many, but I can tell you another one that when Shemitah year was finished, so my field looked like this, like you can see now with all the weeds, all the plastic covers flying in the wind. 
And I was walking like two weeks before Rosh Hashanah, going in my farm and thinking for my, to myself, what am I going to do? How am I going to get back to work? You know, Baruch Hashem, Keren Ashviz helped me to stay with my head above the water like they have all the other farmers in the country. And Baruch Hashem, that we have them. But I had no money. I had no money to, you know, to fix everything and, you know, pay. You, you almost have to start the business from the beginning. And I said, what am I going to do? How am I going to do it? And I, I couldn't fall asleep for, for, for like a few days, you know, and then... I was thinking and thinking, what am I going to do? A week before Rosh Hashanah, I'm getting a phone call from somebody who used to be one of my customers before Shemitah was started. And he calls me and he says, what's going on with you? I heard that you're getting back to work. Do you have uh, specific plans? What are you going to do? What are you going to grow? So I told him, I'll tell you the truth. I really don't know. I want to get back to work, but I really don't know. How am I going to do it? And he said, hold on, I have an offer for you. He said, I'm expanding my business now and I need more produce. I don't have enough greenhouses and fields and I want you, your greenhouses. I want, I want you to grow for me. I'm going to give you a list of organic vegetables that I need. Every week I'll give you the volume of each type of crop and I want you to grow for me. I'm going to pay for all the expenses. I'm going to fix the greenhouses. I'm going to pay for the workers, for the seeds, for, every, for the plants, everything. I just want you to grow. You have the experience. You know how, what to do and everything. And I want to put my brother with you. My brother works with me. I want, I want to put my brother with you to work with you together. And you're going to teach him how to grow organic vegetables. I said, fine. What's the chances that thing, something like that could happen to you? You're getting back to work. Somebody is going to pay you even more than I used to make before when I, when I used to work for myself because this guy, he's doing home delivery. So he, he makes more money than the usual farmers. So what the chances that this guy would be able to pay me more, fix the greenhouses, clean everything, put everything back to work, and, I'm, and I can't lose money because he's paying, is, for yeah, it. he's paying for everything. I told Hashem, thank you so much. This is, that was such a big miracle. We, that's what we did. His brother started to walk with me and three years after he walked with me, he bought his own farm in Moshav Yated. It's about uh, 50 kilometers from here, 30 minutes drive. And um, within the years, he built his own greenhouses, uh, his own warehouse and everything. And I, I, I asked him, two years ago, I asked him, Avi, why are you keep walking with me? You have your own greenhouses, you have your own fields. Why do you need me? He said, in your farm, I have bracha that I couldn't find anywhere else. I'm not living. So the butternut squash that you see here was actually harvested a few weeks before this Shemitah. And these are some of the leftovers. We're still walking until we worked until last Shemitah. And uh, Bezrat Hashem, I hope that... Uh, he would like to get back to work with me after Shemitah. We'll see what Hashem plans for me. Amazing. Yeah, it sounds like till now, uh, you know, Hashem is taking care of you. <laughs> Absolutely, 100%. He's taking care of all of us. So how, how do you feel in this year? You said last Shemitah you, you flew to America for a year. What, uh, what are you doing uh, to fill in the time this Shemitah? So first of all, I do uh, temporary jobs because I have to provide my family. And uh, my son is in the army. And I also help Karen Ashviz. Uh, sometimes I have, every few weeks I fly to America, also to New York area, and I, I'm going in shoes and schools. And I do what I used to do last, last Shemitah, but every once in a few weeks. And Baruch Hashem, I'm happy. That's amazing. And is there the uh, other farmers in this Moshav here and the Moshavim around in this area? Uh, there's a lot of them that also keep Shemitah? Uh, in this Moshav, there are uh, another few farmers who keep Shemitah. Most of the farmers in Israel are doing Heter Mechira, but according to Keren Ashvi's data, I, I think that 51% of the land in Israel is keeping Shemitah. This, this Shemitah, and it's a big achievement because last Shemitah it was only 23 or 24%. So it's really going up. And... I can tell you that I, I, I see many farmers uh, all the time and I, 
I see many farmers that tells me these days that they are they are feeling so sorry that they didn't keep the shmita uh, and they and they made and and they ended up making heter mechira. So bezat Hashem, I I I really think that next shmita will have much more higher percentage than fifty one. Yeah, Mitzvah Hashem, yeah. Bezat Hashem, yeah. Yeah, and do, do you feel, you're saying that you were working with Karen Ashvias, do you feel really that, I mean, this year especially, the, the jump was so big, I mean, they more than doubled, you said it was like 23, now it's over 50%. How do you feel, like, where does that uh, become, the, that growth and the push to, you know, keep on getting more and more farmers, and also how do they get the, the farmers? Are you involved with that as well? So, first of all, because I had the... Uh, such a good experience from my la from my last shmita, so it happened to to be that I I was able to convince few farmers to come and keep shmita. Some of them is a very big farmer who who grows 700 dunams of tomatoes, and he has 80 workers, and he decided to give up on his uh, on his farm this year, and he's so happy. I can tell you, I spoke I, I speak with him once in a few weeks, and the guy is so happy that he decided to keep shmita. And also the other guys, by the way, that I convinced. And you know, people see the farmers are talking with with each other, and I don't know how to explain it. But Baruch Hashem, many people decided, many more people decided to keep shmita this time, and hopefully, hopefully next shmita it will be much more because the old farmers are also telling me there is no bracha walking on uh, on shmita here. So why should I walk? You know. Karen Ashvias, obviously the work they're doing is amazing. You know, you say you also, you know, you were working with them. Um, like inside the organization, do you feel, you know, outside of the money that, that they give to the farmers, like what, is there any like other help and support that they give to the farmers as well? Or it's just the, the money part? Of course, they give a lot of support. If you have questions, if you need assistance with something, so you can always call them and they'll help you. And not only that, they... Now I'm in Israel this year. I, I wasn't here last Shemitah, but I see how many things, how many activities, I don't know if activities is the right word, but how many events and they are doing for the farmers, you know, to, to encourage them and, and, and make them feel that they are not alone. And it's, uh, it's all Am Israel are behind them. And it it's, gives you a lot of strength to, to go through this year. And uh, it's really amazing what Kieran Ashvies is doing. And I don't know what we could, what we, what we would have done without them. So you mentioned the last year there was the nace with Alal, and then with the ended up working with the with the with this other guy that that was in touch with you to fix up the greenhouses. Was there anything uh, uh, this shmita that you feel uh, uh, Nisim miracles that you noticed? I see, I see some things. Yeah, of course, I see. Everything is. Uh, I had a process here in the, in the Moshav of something that I want to build and uh, some people uh, who was in the board here uh, didn't want to sign on the papers for me and I had to go to court and Shmita here started and I, I'm winning them every place I go. Hashem is with me. I, and also all, all the, the, the government offices, you know, that involved in the project that I need their signing on the papers and everything, everything, they are all behind me. Everybody's helping me. Every, everything is, I just need another, another small miracle that it will work out. And Bezrat Hashem, I hope that Bishchut, Dishmita, everything will work out and it will be okay, Bezrat Hashem. But I really feel the Ashgacha. I'm, I'm telling, I don't know how to explain it, but you feel that Hashem is watching you. You feel that whatever you do, everything is Mr. Deir. You always have food on the table and everything you need for the kids and Baruch Hashem. Keeping Shemitah, does it also affect, uh, you know, your relationship with Hashem and Torah and Mitzvot the rest of the of the six years as well? Or is just, you know, during Shemitah, is, you know, that's when you feel it? It, it affected me, all for, I think, for life. Because we as a farmers, we have to be people who has a belief, you know, because when it's hot, you harvest more. When it's cold, you harvest less. You never know if you're gonna have a heat wave or a storm or, or frost or whatever it is. You always depend on Hashem. And the Shemitah also comes to, to give you the, the, the proof, the last proof that 
It doesn't matter what you do. Hashem has his own plans. You have to do the best you can. But at some point, you have to let go, you know? If Hashem wants you to keep Shemitah, you're keeping Shemitah, you let go. And Be'ezrat Hashem, everything is going to be mistader. Everything is going to be okay. And this is how it goes. It's a... Uh, you're always running, you know, people ask me when I was in America, they ask me how much money you lose, what's the annual revenue, what's going on? They're asking about numbers. Then I told them, listen, for me, keeping Shemitah is an investment. When you, uh, you, can, you can think about it if you have a business, okay? You want to you wanna, you wanna expand the business, right? So you have to buy more machines, you have to bring more workers, you have to put money in the business, right? So I'm keeping Shemitah for my business. I'm investing in Shemitah. Except from the other money investment, I'm investing in my Shemitah, which is the best investment. And keeping Shemitah is giving me the Ashgacha and the Emunah and, and the, the success of the business in the future. If you would have the opportunity, you said you already spoke and uh, you know, convinced farmers to keep Shemitah, but what would you tell a farmer and, you know, about to try to convince him uh, uh, to keep Shemitah? First of all, I would tell him that uh, it's a once in a seven year opportunity for very few Jewish people in the world. So he should do it. And second of all, I'm telling him that he would never be regretful keeping this mitzvah. And uh, he will understand it. If you mm. would never regret for doing something, it means it was very successful. So we have talkings, you know, we speak, but these are the two main things that uh, mm -hmm. very important. Yeah, because obviously, I mean, it's it's telling someone to give up on his whole business, and you still, I'm sure, there's you know, there's rent and insurance and, and different stuff. Like you still have expenses, but no income. And... Yeah. First of all, uh, the farmer has to understand that he has Karen Ashviz behind him to help him with whatever they can. And uh, after after that, when when the, when the farmer understands that he can go through the year with his, with his head above the water, he's not going to make money for sure, but he will still keep the head above water. So from now, from, from that point, he could think about, you know, uh, he could be really thinking about how we can do it and, uh, and really go into it and do, and do it and, you know, like it has to be. About Shemitah, um, but how would you explain what you gain to someone who doesn't keep Shemitah? Um, you know, anyone in the world, so, you know, like me and anyone who doesn't have a farm, kind of what do you gain from keeping Shemitah that you feel that, you could only gain from keeping Shemitah. The simplest way to say is, is like, like I said before, is investing in my business, in my life, in my emuna. I'm keeping Shemitah. I'm investing in my emuna. I'm investing in my ashgacha. I'm investing in my, and, and it ended up investing in my business because I feel that bishut keeping this mitzvah and 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 also the big gain is is uh, is is. The connection, the, the connection between our brothers and sisters all around the world and everything is about this mitzvah is something so special and so important. And this is one of the big benefits for me of keeping this uh, beautiful mitzvah of Shemitah. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe. If you would like to help us spread the word, give this video a thumbs up and a five star review. Also, don't forget to ask your friends to subscribe as well. If you would like to partner with us and sponsor an episode, send an email to info at jfoundations.com. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Have a wonderful day. We will see you in the next video.